after I went through that, I, I had a couple of these big aha moments where I just, my, I felt like a window in my mind opened and I saw that the, the world is much bigger than I realized, that my career was an incredible privilege and an incredible gift and didn't have to be everything that I did. And that I had other things to offer besides my flute playing, which I think are ultimately more valuable. Hey everybody, this is Chris from HonestyPill.com. You're listening to episode three of the Honesty Pill podcast. This season on the show, I'll be talking to innovative musician entrepreneurs who've created new ways of performing, new ways of teaching, and new ways of serving their audiences. I can't wait for you to meet today's guest, Elizabeth Rowe, and you're gonna hear more about her background in a minute, but I wanted to quickly highlight that her story is an amazing example of someone who actually did it. They achieved the big goal, got the dream job, had everything she thought she wanted, but had a moment where she realized she had a lot more to offer and made the decision to become a social justice advocate, a public speaker, a high impact coach, a mentor to young musicians, a gender equality trailblazer, and has been willing to share her personal story of learning to embrace the powers of imagination and vulnerability to create connection and community. Oh, and by the way, all of this while holding down a principal position in a major symphony orchestra. This interview was so inspiring for me, and somehow the conversation winds its way from Brene Brown all the way to Dolly Parton, so you're going to want to listen all the way to the end. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. Let's dig in. My guest today is Elizabeth Rowe, who is the principal flutist of the Boston Symphony, one of the most prominent orchestras in the U.S., and certainly one of the greatest in the world. She's also a passionate advocate for gender equality, equal pay, and in fact, her groundbreaking lawsuit in Boston started a lot of important conversations about the gender pay gap, not only in her own orchestra, but in organizations all over the country. Elizabeth also recently gave a TED Talk on what it's like to be an only or someone who is uniquely isolated from their peers because they're different in some important way. When you guys are done listening here, definitely go check that out. It's fantastic to listen to. We're going to get into a lot of topics today, but I'm so excited to have you here, Elizabeth. Thanks for jumping on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So I kind of want to jump into our conversation and ask you a little bit about what it feels like to get a job in a top arts organization like the Boston Symphony. And I wanna quickly explain something to those of you listening who are not in the orchestra world. Most people do not walk out of their college experience and land a job like this. In fact, most people who leave music school don't land a job anywhere. My first job out of school was at Marathon Sports up in Cambridge, so you may, have, you may know it. Um, to, look, to reach this level of imp uh, employment requires a lot of trial and error, a lot of self-awareness and a lot of failure. Could you just quickly compare what it's like for people who don't know to achieve a goal like this uh, in, in an orchestra like this? Yeah, it's um, it's it's a really interesting experience because most of us who are classical musicians who are focused on an orchestral career have been really singularly focused on this for you know since we were oftentimes children or certainly teenagers and. Um, it does require a tremendous amount of discipline and a tremendous amount of self-reflection and introspection. And so we're constantly striving and working to improve, to look at ourselves honestly, to sort of maintain this balance between an impeccable level of craft and our own personal artistic voice, which is really a, a unique challenge within our industry. I think there's very few things that require such a, a marriage of technical craft and individual expression. So, you know, getting a job like this is, it's exhilarating and terrifying, both. <laughs> um, there's a lot of pressure. Um, there's a lot of great opportunity. It's, 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 it's intense. So one of the big focuses on this show is kind of comparing and contrasting what it takes to run a business or to do something different in your life based on the 10,000 hour skills that most musicians put in to get to where you're at. And a big part of trying something new is there's so many emotions that come up. Imposter syndrome, perfectionism, which we are all too well familiar with as orchestral musicians, right? Our job is to go into a room, lock the door and perfect something and then only show it to someone and hope for perfection, which we all know is absolutely unattainable. And I think that that spills over into uh, business life as well. Um, did you always know you wanted to be a professional musician or a flute player? I had a pretty clear idea about it, you know, 
from when I was in my early teen years. Um, but I will tell you that my teacher at the time was was very wise and said to me, you know, if you really want to pursue this career, you can, but you do need to be prepared to wait tables or work at Marathon Sports until you were 30. And I, being a teenager, said, of course, sure. And I didn't really understand what that meant, but at least I had already um, been introduced to the idea that this is, you know, it is, a, it is a difficult industry to break into and it requires a lot of perseverance and, um, you know, and, and hard work. And I think that what you're talking about, these issues of confidence and imposter syndrome and fear and all of that, they, um, you know, they're, they're kind of a through line for most of us in, in, our, in our careers in this industry. Did you feel like there was a point where, well, first of all, what was your audition history like? Did you go out there and win your first one or did you struggle for a while? What did it look like for you? Oh yeah, I took tons of auditions. Um, yeah, how lots many? And how lots. many tons? Do you, do you have a number you could share? I need to go back and really count, but I'm sure I took. I must have been in the double digits before I got my first job, which was in the Fort Wayne Philharmonic in Indiana. And as I advanced in my career, I got better at everything. I got better at being a musician, better at being a flutist, and better at taking auditions. So my success rate, if that's what you want to call it increased as I moved farther into my career. So it took me a long time to get going. Um, I shouldn't say a long time, but it, you know, I, you know, had a lot of, I hate to use the word failures, but I had a lot of experiences that did not result in me being offered a job. Um, and, uh, just gradually worked on my skills as both a musician and as an audition taker, which are really different sets of skills and got better at both. Oh, that's a whole nother podcast that the audition skills and how they're not necessarily related to anything that we do on stage. Oh, we'll have For to sure. we'll have to circle back to that one. So, look, I also have a um, a long history of broken audition records. I, I mean, I'm meaning failures. I failed at a lot of auditions. In fact, I have a binder that's probably about this thick, about six inches thick filled with rejection letters from festivals, from concerto competitions, from orchestras, all all over the place. And I often, when I do a, uh, a class in person, I'll bring that binder. And similar to your teacher who said, if you want this type of a career, be willing to work at a shoe store. I say, if you're not willing to rack up a binder this big, you know, this may not be for you. And the best part about that binder is there are a few rejection letters from orchestras that I later ended up getting employed at. So there's always hope if you persevere. Um, talk about failure for a minute. What what um, things did you learn? What was what's your biggest failure? Would you say? Oh gosh. Um, well, I, let me put it this way. What's what's your biggest failure that you think you got a great takeaway from? Yeah, this is a great question. I think my answer to that is kind of it's it's big. I think my answer to that. So I'm not going to point to a single audition or um, kind of a one one moment in my life, I would say that my, my biggest failure, um, was actually the, the, the pattern that I developed really in my, in this role that I've been in, in the Boston symphony, where I've been under such pressure and so much, um, so much spotlight put on me and felt pretty isolated in that role. And my choice to kind of double down on the kind of facade of, um, flawlessness and um, armor that I developed to essentially keep myself safe from the judgment that I felt coming my way, I now see in retrospect as sort of a failure of imagination and, and really courage to allow myself to be seen, you know, with the flaws, with the vulnerabilities, with the failures, all of that, which now with a lot of hindsight, I understand that it's such a stronger position to be able to just be yourself fully warts and all your six inch binder of, of rejection letters. Um, all of that, because it's, it's, first of all, it's the truth about who you are, but second of all, it allows for a kind of connection and empathy and community that is so strengthening and uh, empowering, um, which I, I didn't really fully understand for a lot of my professional life. And I do now. And that's so, I guess if you want to consider that a failure or certainly something that I have learned the hard way, that would be it. Your story is just so relatable to musicians, non-musicians, men, women, everyone. And I think that a lot of people who've kind of climbed the mountain and, and 
achieve the great goal, whether it's to become a professional athlete or an Olympiad or a classical musician in the Boston Symphony, we all have to face similar things. And I love the fact that you you mentioned developing an armor. And I didn't exactly have the same experience, but I developed my own type of armor, which was um, community. I was attracted to a group of uh, players who had similar views that unfortunately weren't very industry standard at the time. And so that was, I, I would say that's my biggest failure was sort of succumbing to a dogmatic approach on how to do something. There's no one way to do anything. There's no right or wrong. In fact, you've got to screw up before you figure out how to do any of this stuff. And that that's never been more obvious when you look at someone's audition record. Look, very few people succeed the very first time they try and hit a golf ball, right? You have to fail. You have to practice. It takes observation and self-awareness and skills and honesty and all that stuff. But the perfectionism and vulnerability that is just in and out of what we do in orchestras and also what people do are just creating something new. And I think that's one of the biggest topics that I'm trying to bring to light is if you're going to try something new, you're going to screw up, you're going to have mistakes, and you're going to fail. And you've got to embrace that failure, push through it. It's not something to get over. It's something that's going to help you become what it is that you wanted to do. I agree. And I also think it's I think it's so interesting to really explore the stories that we tell ourselves about other people and the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. But I think we're especially prone to looking at people who from the outside appear to have it all or have achieved the thing and to and just assume it was just this kind of straight path with no dips and turns and never falling on your butt on the way, you know, and never any of that. And, and I think it's easy for us when we, especially when we're not able to be around people who are being honest and being vulnerable and sharing their, you know, failures or setbacks or mistakes. It's really easy for us to think that other people have it all figured out in this sort of way. And nobody has it figured out and everybody makes mistakes, but not everybody talks freely about it. So I think it's really so powerful what you're doing, just basically putting it out there and sharing that because it, it, it gives everybody confidence and to take a risk. Yeah, the, the minute it's a Brene Brown, I always quote Brene Brown about how vulnerability is the cradle of creativity. And the minute that I got honest with myself was the minute I started to have success and get in alignment. So you're, you're kind of talking about claiming your authority a little bit, too, where you compare yourself to what others are doing. Oh, that person has it all figured out. They've been doing this for so much longer. They have a more natural setup for this or for that. And it's a hard one for musicians to get over because we do tend to have a little bit of, I don't want to say hero worship, but when we're students, we definitely put our mentors on pedestals that are, it's, it's like professional athletes. We don't have baseball cards or anything. Actually, in the LA Phil, we actually do have baseball cards. <laughs> they made baseball cards to hand out to the youth concert. So, you know, I mean, that's kind of strange, even though I thought it was a lovely gesture. Um, but let's talk about claiming your authority a bit, because it's easy for you and I to sit back and say all these things because we have the comfort and the social proof of established positions in, in you know, well-known arts organizations. But for someone who's just starting out, they might be thinking, why should anyone listen to me? Why should anyone want to hire me? And I think that's a big hurdle for a lot of artists. And that is where we tend to go off the rails in both our mindset and how we think what what we think success looks like. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I was really fortunate to study with teachers all along the way who really emphasized and prioritized all of their students and, and me as their student, finding my own distinctive artistic voice. And not only to find my own voice, but actually to, to follow my own path in terms of my career. So that it wasn't just about getting a big job, it was about finding what was fulfilling to me. And it wasn't just about sounding like some other really wonderful flute player. It was about finding my own voice. And I spent the most of my 20s thinking, have I found my voice? Is this my voice? Is that my voice? What's my, what's my voice? And I, I was, and I, and then one day I woke up and I was sort of like, yeah, this is it. This is, this is my artistic voice. And I think, I don't think you just come upon that without searching for it. So I think that the searching is part of the process of bringing you to that place. But, but I, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I, I want to say that I think I probably got clarity on that in the middle of my maybe third job that I had. It's not as if I had to have that figured out in order to get a job. I didn't. It's just, it's a, it's a journey that we're all on. And so 
I think to the extent that um, young musicians feel like they are still searching for their voice and searching for their place in the world, it's it's absolutely normal. And, and that search in and of itself has so much value that because it produces something that's really rich and personal and persuasive. And once you can really, you know, the Sometimes the hardest thing is deciding what you want to say. And then the next hardest thing is figuring out how to say it. And that's what we work on all the time as musicians. And I think that that's such a, an honorable pursuit. And there's no shame in that. There's no shame in still questioning that and wondering what, what that's about. And by the way, here's a newsflash, folks, for anyone listening who is thinking about finding your voice. I'm still searching for my voice every day. And in fact, I don't think that that ever stops if you are a person who is interested in creating new things and pivoting and adapting and evolving. Because uh, we're going to talk about this more in a minute. We talk about your evolution as a coach. You may think that when you achieve your next big goal, and I'm, this could be anything for you, that it's all going to be perfect. And then you've, you'll finally be able to calm down and you'll finally start meditating and doing that self-care just when I hit that big goal. And the, the, the reality is it's a never ending process and it's a journey. It sounds so cliche to say it, but literally you have to enjoy the process of, of whatever it is you're doing. Otherwise, these little mile markers are nice. But what happens then is we become so reactive to what's happening around us and we become dependent on those reactions, which is fine when your career is, is kicking and you're, you're, you're in the LA Phil, you're in the Boston Symphony and everything's great. But then the moment you have a bad concert or maybe you have an injury or you know things went off the rails with a colleague or the orchestra shuts down <laughs> during a pandemic, if you are so tied into that as your uh, thermometer for how you feel, for your alignment, that's trouble. And this is a volatile industry at best. If you're lucky enough to get into a group like you and I have, or to have a career that is quote unquote uh, stable, it, even then it's volatile. Not every week is gonna be the most inspiring thing. So it's important to know, I, I think Deepak Chopra talks about this in one of his books. I can't remember what he calls it, but it's about being internally aligned with, with your happiness as opposed to reactive to the things around you. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big topic. But I want to get a little more of your background, though. Um, you mentioned your teacher. Who, who are some people who have been influential to you, either on the flute or just in general in your life? Yeah, so I, I was really lucky. I had some really great teachers um, that set me up really well on my instrument, you know, starting, you know, at the beginning of my studies, really, elementary school, middle school, high school. Um, and then I went to school in your neck of the woods. I went to uh, University of Southern California and studied with Jim Walker and for my undergrad. And he was... He was so wonderful because, I mean, he taught me all the skills that I needed on the instrument, but but he really um, focused so much on acknowledging and validating kind of every human being's different path and different set of priorities that they have. So, you know, sometimes these big, big name teachers are really invested in their students achieving something that the teacher can then write down on their on their checklist. Like I have all these students in orchestras or I have all these students who've won these competitions. And that's, you know, that's that's wonderful. And there's nothing wrong with that. But he was really um, much more interested in seeing his students thrive as whole human beings. And he really he 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 was an incredible example of this because he he actually left his job in the LA Phil um, after being he was um, principal flutist the LA Phil and I think he was there for less than a decade and and then he left because he wanted to do the, have more freedom he wanted to work in the studios he wanted to teach more he wanted to learn how to play jazz and he just like that sheer act of bravery and also of essentially honoring his own of you know interests and what drove him and his passions led him to take this career step that I think everybody thought was crazy, um, or maybe not crazy, but it was just uh, really unusual to step away from a great job like that and to do some other stuff. And so I think he basically always held open this possibility for all of us that life is much more than one job. It's much more than a title. It's, and it can be something, you know, success means something completely different for everybody. And that was what he was really invested in. That and a really centered sound and impeccable intonation. <laughs> so. That is incredibly rare. And what a gift that you, you had someone like that in your life. I think I don't know too many people that have 
told me stories about mentors or teachers who said something like, there's more to you than your instrument and being obviously you have to master your instrument, but there's more to it than just that. It, that's a very rare thing and lucky indeed for you. And I, apparently that's influenced your path as well. Um, this is actually a pretty good segue into my next question, which is when you talked about your teacher leaving a position, a principal position in a major orchestra, why would someone who's finally gotten to the level that let's say that you have in a position in an orchestra like yours, why would you think about ever wanting to do anything else? Was there something that caused you to want to do something different? Was there a frustration with your situation? Is there other stuff you've always been interested in? Like what, what happened that made you think, you know, I want to be more of an advocate. I want to be more of a mentor to students who need me and to sort of get beyond the, I'm going to show up and be a really excellent flute player because a lot of musicians, that's where they're, where they're at. What, what, what happened to cause you to do that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, I've always been really interested in the, this sounds like a strange thing to say, but sort of the human side of, of, of my work. So the relationships at work, the, the working with my students, not just about developing their flute playing and their musicianship, but also really supporting them around life decisions and around, um, you know, finding that place that's right for them, the balance between their um, their career aspirations and their personal values and aspirations. And so that was always something that I, I think, got a lot of satisfaction from. I thought it was very rich and interesting, um, but I didn't really put a, a name on it or identify it as something concrete that I, that I did. Um, it was just something that was in the, in the air and in, the, in my way of, of, of being with people. And I think it, it's really within the last few years, you know, I went through this really difficult um, period of time when I was involved in this lawsuit. Um, it, that whole experience really, you know, it shook me up in a lot of ways and, and was a tremendous gift in the sense that it opened my mind to a lot of things. I talk about learning how to drop that armor that I had built up about learning how to find a different kind of community and different kinds of connections with people that were far outside of our industry. So all of a sudden I'm experiencing this connection and this empathy and this shared experience with, with men and women and people in all walks of life who I actually had far more in common with than I would have known because we're in such a small industry and we're so, you know, musicians tend to hang out with musicians and we tend to marry musicians and we tend to, you know, that and we work strange hours. And so it's just very normal for our world to feel kind of small. And um, after I went through that, I, I had a couple of these big aha moments where I just, my, I felt like a window in my mind opened and I saw that the, the world is much bigger than I realized that my career was an incredible privilege and an incredible um, gift and didn't have to be everything that I did. Um, and that I had other things to offer besides my flute playing, which I think are ultimately more valuable in, in many ways, or maybe more important to me. And so even just to kind of acknowledge that and recognize that is a, a big step. It's a little bit scary when you have a, a job that has so much security as much as we have now at the moment. Um, and just to even contemplate broadening your professional horizons. Um, but it's been liberating and um, exhilarating and energizing. And um, it, I think it makes me a better flutist and a better musician too. Did you feel at all guilty about considering doing something different with your life? In, ter in terms of becoming a coach or, or working outside of just playing the flute, did you feel like, wow, I'm not really honoring this position? Well, th that's, a, that's a wonderful question. I mean, uh, one of the opportunities that this um, prolonged work stoppage has, has offered me is the chance to really um, delve much more deeply and much more quickly into this other line of work that I'm so committed to, interested in, which is my coaching work. And, um, and so I haven't yet faced a situation where I feel like I'm spread too thin. Um, I don't know when that may happen. Um, there's a lot of things that will determine that. Um, but I, I really profoundly believe that 
being a a happy, energized, centered, well-fed, and I don't mean with food, although that's great too, um, <laughs> but human being is will do nothing except for support my work in the chair with the Boston Symphony when I get back into my chair with the Boston Symphony. Um, so I don't feel guilt right now. Um, I don't know if that will change for me at some point. I know for me, I, I didn't really feel guilt, but I did feel it felt strange to announce that I was not I was changing how I was teaching. That That's how it started for me was an, uh, a metamorphosis of how I was teaching the trumpet and specifically audition strategy, where it wasn't just let's have a one on one lesson. I'll meet you at the, at the hall after a concert or whatever, and we'll chat and we'll talk and we'll exchange dollars for hours. And then I evolved it into I'm going to create this whole movement about demystifying what it means to take an audition and showing people what I think it takes to prepare and leaning into that so much that people started talking to me more about that than being a trumpet player in the LA Phil. And that did feel a little strange for a while. Um, but it's kind of, it's kind of funny that I would say that because in the end, the skills that I've developed as a trumpet player and figuring those things out are exactly what makes me feel confident in talking about all these other topics. So I think sometimes people who strive for excellence, it's just fun to find something new to strive for after a while. And it, whether that be coaching or starting a business or becoming more of an arts advocate or or, or doing all the things that you've done. Um, as far as coaching, what's your goal? What's your sort of um, aim? And what do, you, what do you want to focus on with your coaching practice? Yeah, so my coaching practice is um, really closer to what we might traditionally call life coaching than it is something like business coaching or um, career coaching within our industry. So I'm really interested in working with creative people of all sorts, but creative people can be found in, you know, create creative people who are scientists and who are school teachers and who are, you know, you, you name it. So um, I think the thing that really excites me is helping people who, um, you know, feel like they may have really bumped up against some obstacles or feel a little bit trapped or feel a little stuck in their lives, um, finding them a way forward that gets them to this place where their life is, where they have this, this opportunity to really shine with all of their, with all of their gifts and to um, not feel boxed in by either their career or the choices they've made up until now and to give them the opportunity to you know, coaching work at its best is really allowing, providing a space for people to think really clearly and, th and and make their own discoveries about what is true for them and what is best for them. And we so rarely have a chance to sit with someone else who is there really just to support you in your own path towards clarity and um, who can help you take those steps forward that sometimes just are there's small steps, but they feel almost impossible to do without another person there saying, let's do this to happen. How about that? And I know from my own work with coaches that, you know, sometimes they, they just, they'll say to me, you know, you it, it would really advance this project of yours if you would just send that email. <laughs> and, and, yeah, I know this, but yet to have someone who sits there and who, who provides that sort of gentle accountability and that opportunity for me to question, you know, why didn't I send that email and what's getting in my way? And then to confront, oh, well, that's actually because I'm afraid of something or I'm fearing judgment about this. And so it, this is what I'm really interested in is kind of walking with people, supporting people um, in whatever projects they're working on, whether it's a, a career project or more of an internal project, like developing confidence in their relationships or in the workplace. Um, so it's, 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 it's a real privilege actually for me to be able to to do this kind of work oh i love what you just said about walking with someone in in their path that whether it's the project or their journey in general self-exploration and it it does seem strange to use the word coach and and part of stepping into this space it it does require a certain wrangling with imposter syndrome to say i am a stra a business coach i am an audition coach i am a life coach whatever you want to call it but if you think about it in terms of our history as musicians, we had a teacher, right? A trumpet teacher, a flute teacher, but we also had like a quintet coach, 
right? And and that didn't sound strange at all to call that person for chamber music a coach. And I thought, I've been thinking about this a lot. Why was that word so natural in that setting? And for me, it's like, well, the coach isn't there to sit in a chair and tell you exactly what this should sound like, because that is not the purpose of chamber music or, or any music, really. And chamber music is such a great um, conduit to ex explore learning to work with others and to find your way together. And that is exactly what a coach does. They create an environment for you to do your best thinking. And frankly, if, if you really want to unpack it further, maybe teachers should be called coaches as far as how we approach our time with them because they don't have the answers either. I don't have the answers. You don't have all the answers. But what we do have is a unique perspective in that we have done this before. We've screwed it up a lot. Most of us have. And we've figured out some way to make it work and still maintain some kind of balance in our lives. And I think if you think about that definition of teacher versus coach, or an even better one is a professor, right? What does a professor do? They profess something, right? I actually think that, and I'm sort of picking on grammar and, and, and the meanings of these words in a silly way, but in reality, if you approach the relationship with someone else with the idea of workshopping, of creating a thinking environment, of inspiring your best thinking for both, by the way, the, the student can help the coach uh, do their best work as well if they're aligned and open to that work. So I think it's a natural evolution for somebody who wants to connect either with other musicians or with students or with arts advocacy or whatever it is that you want to do to sort of have to have a shift in that mindset, which sounds like you've done. Yeah. And I, it's, 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 I, I really have been taking a, an approach that's in alignment with this for many, many years with my teaching as well, because I really prefer to teach in a way that inspires my that allows my students really to start to teach themselves and to think for themselves. And I really have always felt strongly that the role of a teacher, even in a formal teacher student relationship, the role of a teacher is not just to sort of disseminate information and then for the student to kind of passively receive it, that there's, that there is a real, there's a real exchange of ideas and the best teachers ask the right questions. And that's so much what coaching is about too. It's not telling somebody things it's asking, the question that then allows someone to arrive at an answer for themselves. I was working with one of my with one of my coaching clients a few weeks ago um, who was bumping up against some fear about um, actually it was about commissioning a piece of music and um, they had they'd set up a whole bunch of obstacles for themselves in terms of their thinking and thinking about well what if the piece isn't very good or what if the piece doesn't suit my instrument or what if the piece doesn't suit me and my playing well and I was able to help her just through a series of questions come out of that with this beautiful, astonishing plan to um, find a, a particular style of composer to commission a piece in, with a particular framework and to build something that was around a subject that was incredibly powerful and meaningful to her. And I, I, I what I allowed to happen was for her to generate this incredible concept. I didn't come up with it. It wasn't my idea. It was her idea. But I, by asking her the kinds of questions that often we aren't in a space where we're asked those kinds of questions, you know, her mind was able to kind of open up and explore these possibilities that weren't there before. So it's, it's, it's a really joyful experience to be in that kind of partnership with someone. I think you make a really good point about the invitation to have your best thinking. And um, I've definitely found that when I stop talking and trying to instruct, I, look, here's a great example. I have two kids, they're eight and 10. And, you know, I, I try and tell them what to do a lot. And, you know, I don't need to, I'm not breaking any news here that that does not work very well. Um, but inviting them to think about a solution, even if it's something simple, like, you know, so what do you think is going to happen today if you don't um, make lunch before school starts, what do you think is going to happen around noon? And instead of me saying, you didn't make your lunch, you're not going to have time, you're going to run, blah, 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 blah. It, even that's a pretty basic example. I guess I'm, it's not hypothetical. I had that conversation right before we hopped on this call, actually. So um, <laughs> yeah, this invitation to helping people think is, is a brilliant tool to just get people to find what they want. 
we probably know some of the things that they might need. The path to success looks different for everyone, but there are certain things that have to happen, especially if you're working on something like auditions, for example. You need to record yourself. You need to take auditions. You need to study. You need to listen back. You need to be organized. But there's probably some more things going on there that we don't know about as a coach or a teacher or a mentor or whatever that it can only be unpacked if you create the space for your student or your client to do so. So speaking of coaches, and, and I don't know when the last time you took a flute lesson was, but I think people might be surprised that we still seek instruction. We still seek guidance. Look, professional athletes have coaches. Actors have coaches. People who are very successful still rely on coaches for the exact reasons that we just outlined. So what, what caused you to seek out a coach? That's a great question. So I, um, you know, I had spent some time exploring a lot of different avenues to kind of tap into this desire that I had to have a, a fuller professional life. And I had, um, I embarked actually on a series of informational interviews with people, you know, where you meet people that are interesting, doing interesting things. And you just say, can I talk to you for an hour about what you do for a living? And, um, I talked to a bunch of different people and including some coaches and, um, got, really fascinated by this line of work and how it's structured and and the I love the kind of non hierarchical nature of it in a lot of ways. And um, so I in the course of, of of having these conversations, I met a woman who is one of my two coaches that I work with now. And she um, I just you know, I, I had a really good I had a good personal response to her and her background aligned with mine. She's not a musician, but she's um, a former, she had been an actress and she had been, you know, she had a degree and you know, she, it, she just had a, some, a very interesting background and I felt like was able to kind of understand where I was coming from being an artistic creative person and wanting to expand my, my career and my reach. So I started working with her in, right before the, um, the pandemic actually. <laughs> And it was the most transformational experience for me because she, you know, the, the floor fell out from underneath our feet. Those of us who really were really working full time in these big orchestras where it feels like close to a full time job all the time. And um, she is the one who, again, by asking me the questions and giving me the nudges and, you know, providing the accountability and all of that, um, basically allowed me to make this incredibly rapid progress into achieving clarity about what I, my vision for myself. So, um, so I work with her, um, and I also work with, um, Jennifer Rosenfeld, who is a phenomenal coach, a business coach for musicians and, um, who is helping me through a wonderful program that she's running. Um, again, kind of get clarity on, what I want to build on the business side of it on so many other fascinating elements to the work that we do. So I, I, I can't envision myself ever not having support of some sort in by a coach and or by other kinds of people in my life as well. You know, I've had therapists, I've had, I've, you know, as a, in my developing career as a flute player, I've played for all sorts of people. I played first, I played for um, a colleague who was principal flutist at the St. Louis Symphony right before my Boston Symphony audition. Um, you know, it's it's part of, I think, being, um, you know, lifelong learning is is such a, an important part of who I am. And I think it is for anybody who wants to continue to thrive and grow. We have to keep expanding our, our minds and we need other people to be with us as we do that. I also, um, I always will want the support. P part of it too is if you want to do something, if you want to evolve where you're at, and this could be going out to people who are aspiring to be orchestral musicians or college professors or authors or professional athletes or whatever it is, the easiest thing you can do is find someone who is doing the thing that you want to do and have a conversation with them. Take a lesson, go to their class, watch their YouTube video, read their book, whatever it is, because literally they are going to be able to help you sidestep a lot of the pitfalls that you are going to step into. And by the way, you're still going to step into them. You're probably going to create some of your own new ones, and that's totally okay. That is part of the evolution process that, that gets us there. 
Was there someone who was doing something um, in this space that really inspired you and thought, oh, hey, I'd like to do that? Was there a specific coach or uh, person who inspired you to think, maybe this is something I could really do and help people in a new way, other than inspiring hundreds and hundreds of people every week in the Boston Symphony? Um, you know, I think so many musicians are unfamiliar with the coaching industry and the coaching world. So, and I count myself among them until, you know, a few years ago, certainly. And um, so I think that for me, part of what has been the the fear factor for me and the, where the imposter syndrome pops up for me also is um, actually believing that I'm, I want to kind of create a, a niche for myself and a role for myself that is unique. And so, and I believe that I can, um, but, but so there are, there are a lot of people that I admire in, in with like in terms of aspects of their businesses and aspects of the way they work. I mean, who wouldn't want to like, you know, be Brene Brown or who wouldn't want to, um, you know, or there's any number of people who are, I admire their thinking and I admire um, their, or I admire their business or I admire all of that. And, and I think part of what has been really a, a huge opportunity for me is to try to pull from all of that and create something that I feel like is, is, is true for me. So in my case, it's it's a little bit of a marriage of the expertise that I bring from my long history in this profession, but a real desire to step beyond that into this work that is that is more whole person oriented. So I'm quite certain that there are incredible coaches out there who who have figured out this exact kind of position with one foot into the expertise consulting kind of world and another into this more broad life coaching kind of world. And I'm looking to kind of build my own space in there. So I guess I didn't really answer your question, except for that I want to grow up to be like Brene Brown. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I was just going to say that I would also like to grow up to be Brene Brown, but I don't know if I have what it takes to be Brene Brown. Um, I'm not sure I can do that. I'm, I'm working on it every day. So Brene, if you're listening, you're, you're, you're my hero. Um, you know, you've you've accomplished so much and you've had so many experiences. What would you what would you say to someone who is looking to follow in a, a career path like yours? What's one thing you wish you had known when you first started out, either as an orchestral player or now in your new role as a coach as well? Yeah, I think I mean, I, I want to say two things about that. First of all, I, I really want to um, say to anybody who looks at a career like mine and gives me credit for having accomplished that. I really want to emphasize how much luck was involved and how much I, um, you know, being at the right place at the right time involves there even being a right place to be, which means that I had flute auditions to take. You know, there were a lot of openings in, in at the early part in my career, and I was able to take a lot of auditions and learn a lot through a lot of, of, of those kinds of opportunities. There are periods of time when there are very few positions open. And, um, you know, I, I think it's, again, when I talk about the stories that we tell about other people, I think sometimes it's easy to look at my trajectory and have someone say, okay, I want that, therefore I'm going to follow these 10 steps. And I think there are some real concrete practical steps that will get you, and this is what you teach, I mean, that it will get you positioned so that you are ready to deliver your absolute best artistry and technical um, skills and everything else and, and show up for the audition at, at 100%. And there have to be auditions to take and there's luck involved and there's a learning process that takes place. So I think the thing that I think is so hard to know and to understand, especially when you're young and you're really gunning for all of this is that as much as you can also, while you are focusing mind, body and soul on developing your craft and your, and your audition skills and all of that to also fill up the rest of the buckets in your life, like the, the, the relationships, the taking care of your body, the um, understanding what brings you joy outside of your your work. Also understanding how to find motivation and meaning within the work that you're doing that is not dependent on external titles or accomplishments like we were talking about earlier. So I think, you know, I didn't have that figured out at an early point in my life. And I, and I think it's something that I'm hoping that as more of us start talking about this, that it becomes more more of a priority as we are learning and as we're focusing so hard on achieving these really high and important goals to also understand that getting the job isn't going to therefore fill us up entirely. Like getting the job is a huge accomplishment and we need relationships. We need to be able to take care of ourselves and our, and our mental health, our emotional health, our physical health, all of that. So it's, it's, um, I think 
the industry has changed a lot, like since you and I were coming up in it. And I think programs like yours are, it's, I mean, it's radical. There's nothing that like that that existed for us when we were, when we were starting out. And it's, it's such a gift. I mean, it's such an unbelievable gift to provide that kind of framework for all of these musicians and also to provide the community for them to be able to experience this with each other and to witness everybody else's struggles and accomplishments and questions and understand that you're not alone. And I think that's the biggest gift of all really is that is to know that you're not alone in all of this. And, you know, one, one job or one title or one thing doesn't really define you. It's, it's, it's all of this. That's so awesome. Actually, I I want people to listen to your TED talk and I'm going to link it up in the show notes, but could you just talk for a minute about the lonely onlys and the concept behind that? Because what you just said, and again, people who are listening may not understand how you could be sitting in the middle of a 110-piece orchestra in, in, a, in a venue like the Hollywood Bowl with 18,000 people around you and still feel very isolated. And what we're doing uh, is, is, is also very new. I don't want to say it's, you know, maybe it is leading edge. Who knows? But what it is is a white space. Most people are not delving into this way of thinking just because... It hasn't really been necessary. It is totally necessary now and and has been before the pandemic, by the way. I'm not talking about just COVID. I'm talking about the state of the arts and the way that we communicate with other people and the way that so many people don't connect because they feel like they're not deserving or they don't understand or they need to be, you know, I always say you do not need a PhD in musicology to listen to a Mozart symphony. You just need to have a pulse, show up and enjoy it or not, but have some sort of an authentic connection. I feel like that is getting, that gap is getting further and further apart. And then you add the pandemic on top of it and it has literally turned the volume to 11 on this problem that has existed for a long time. We're we're about 100 years behind the times, I would say. I don't know, maybe that's an exaggeration, but we are definitely, as, as classical orchestral musicians, even the term classical musicians is such a misnomer. I don't know, have, have you seen Walt Disney Concert Hall? There's not very much classical about it, you know, as, know, as is most of the music that we play there. It is a very isolated feeling to be doing something new and it's scary and there is imposter syndrome and you feel like, wait, am I crazy? I'm the only one up here. What is what does that mean for you? And, and uh, give us a little snapshot of the lonely onlys. Yeah. So I think that this is such an important topic because I think, you know, I think loneliness is one of those human conditions that is so common and it's so prevalent in our industry and in society at large. And there's a lot of there can be a lot of shame around that. There can be a lot. It's hard to kind of come out and say, I'm I, I'm surrounded by people and I'm lonely or I have great friends and I, yet I find myself lonely in my in my professional life. Or I think that um, there's a, a lot of things that are contributing to that. I mean, now, of course, there's the pandemic. There's the, the kind of superficiality of, of social media and what, the ways that that can actually help drive people apart in, in a lot of ways because of the lack of authenticity and so much of what social media puts out. But in our industry in particular, I think there is this, we are so accustomed to being alone in the practice room, looking at ourselves for the flaws and trying to improve and constantly, I mean, I remember after every audition that I would take, I felt just emotionally wrung out. And it wasn't so much from the day of the audition or the days of the audition, it was the entire process leading up where I was examining myself so deeply and looking for the ways that I was not measuring up and looking for the ways that I needed to improve. And I think that um, we so often can slip from observation into judgment. So you can observe something about yourself and say, my articulation could use some work. Or the judgment is, I have terrible articulation, or I am a terrible flutist, or I am, you know. And um, so especially in this when we slip into that judgment or even just fear of others judging us, it can feel extremely isolating, especially when we're not in the habit of sharing these feelings with other people. And so this was my biggest lesson that I have learned is that, you know, I was sitting in my position. I was a, a principal player in a major orchestra. The, the Boston Symphony has a cohort of principal players. There's one other woman who's a principal player. She's our harpist. She's amazing. Smaller group than that yet is the Boston Symphony Chamber Players, which is a touring group, and we spend a lot of time together doing performances. I'm the only woman in that group. I felt very isolated, very much like a spotlight was on me, very much like I had a narrow path to prove my worth. And that I, how much of that 
is in my imagination how much of that is true it's impossible to know but that was my my experience and when you're in a position like that and you feel as if there's nobody who really can relate to it or nobody you can talk to about it or nobody who understands it can feel very very lonely what i've learned is that there are plenty of people who can relate and plenty of people who you can talk to about it they just not be may not be in the obvious places and so for me i had to look outside you know my tiny world. I had to look into to find people all over the place who actually found me because of my lawsuit. And that's how I learned this lesson is they wrote to me and they said, I, I so relate to what you're talking about. I so relate to your story. Here's my story. And I started getting these letters and these messages. And it just, I, it, it's like, I couldn't believe that I hadn't seen that before, but I hadn't. Um, and I also started having these conversations with young musicians where I really recognized that it was critically important that they not see me as this perfect person up on a pedestal that that did them a huge disservice. And it also did me a huge disservice because we weren't connecting as, as, as human beings, we were connecting as sort of caricatures, you know, and, um, once I dropped my armor with them, once I recognized that this connection was available to me everywhere, um, my loneliness dissipated and my, my, position in my job is the same. I'm still the only woman in the chamber. You know, none of the circumstances have changed, but my interaction with the world has changed and my understanding of connection has changed. I heard, um, you know, Toronto Burke, who, who uh, was really the person who started the Me Too movement way before the Me Too movement became kind of a, a national and international um, movement. Um, she was working with survivors of largely of domestic violence and just basically trauma survivors. And she came up with that me that the whole premise behind that me too hashtag is that exact thing. Me too. I get it. And it can be a tiny, I heard her do an interview where she said, you know, two people can have vastly different experiences, but they intersect in one tiny place where there's something in common. And then it's that moment where you can say me too. And that's where that empathy is, and that's where that connection is, and then that's where power is. And so power comes from that, that, that tiny sliver of me too. And so I experienced that, I was the recipient of that through my, through the, my experience with my lawsuit, and, and I'm now trying to give back in the way that I can, which is to basically look for these moments of connection and vulnerability and authenticity with people in our industry and especially with these young people coming up in the industry um, to just say, you know, me too. And I hear you and I've been there, you know, and I think that that's, there is where the loneliness, that's empathy and connection are the antidote to loneliness basically. So at least that's what I found. I want to quickly circle back here to something you said about shame and, and the, the emotion of shame. And I've heard shame described as the most useless emotion because, and, and here's why I, I repeat this all the time. The difference between shame and guilt is, guilty is, oh, I feel so bad that I, I didn't prepare more and I kind of screwed up that rhythm and I kind of tanked the whole section. And I'm sorry, guys, I won't let that happen again. Whereas shame is, I'm a bad person because I didn't do a good job or I didn't, um, you know, I didn't try hard enough. It it becomes judgment that is absolutely damaging. And and I've heard it described that shame is the most useless emotion because there's really nothing that good that can come out of it. Now, vulnerability is not the same thing as shame, but it's the pathway, at least through that. And, you know, I actually would suggest don't even feel guilty because people make mistakes all the time. And, you know, it's not intentional. And you have to sort of fumble through things to to get it right. Elizabeth, I want to ask you just one more question. But have you read anything or listened to anything lately that's really inspired you? A book or a piece of music or or something? Yes. Um, oh gosh, the list is long. I'm going to give you a, a practical book, and I'm going to give you a fun book. So the practical book that I read is called Deep Work by Cal Newport, and it is. I mean, this is coming from a, just a, a, a pure like. Um, well, it actually really comes from this idea of, of giving ourselves the opportunity to think deeply. And he, it's, a, it's a fascinating book about understanding the difference between deep work and shallow work and, and how we can structure our lives to better make space for deep work and what that looks like. And for me, I tend to be, I'm very, I, I make myself very busy. I tend to feel 
happiest when I'm like in motion and getting stuff done. And I have learned to give myself space to sit and be with my thoughts and to think deeply. And it's been transformative for me. So I think, um, it, especially in today's day, age, like digital age and all of that, and, um, you know, emails and texts, and that has been really, it's just been an interesting practical piece of learning for me. I also, um, you know, there, there's this book, um, by, read by Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F, that is, there's actually two books. It's called Mindful Compassion or Self-Compassion. And she has, a, and there's a workbook that goes with it. And um, it's really all about this, this, this idea of extending compassion to yourself first before, in order to sort of get through this, this, this huge challenge of shame and um, which I have found to be very helpful. And a lot of people I work with find it to be very helpful also. So the Mindful Self-Compassion workbook and then um, Self-Compassion by Kristen Neff um, are really powerful tools. I think if, if shame or negative self-talk or, you know, being really hard on yourself is something that you struggle with. Those are really great. On, on a more fun level, I love, love the Neapolitan novels by Elena Ferrante. They came out, oh, they were published. Oh, I don't know when they were published. Um, but they're now, I think HBO is, is making a mini series out of them. The first one is called My Brilliant Friend. It's about this friendship between these two girls. It, um, over the span of their lifetime and it's a giant four volume set if you really want to like go to the beach haha and sit with you know four giant books um this is it this is it's just wonderful it's a i, I don't know it's just, it, there's just something about it that speaks to me really in a really beautiful way i think it's because it has a really honest portrayal of friendship it's not this kind of pastel colored you know sunshine and butterflies kind of thing it's 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 the real deal I, I love that you're recommending two books at the beach because I think people who are striving or in a mode of reinvention, it's easy to focus on books like the ones I have behind me on my bookshelf where all like, you know, mental, technical mindset golf books about, you know, the, the inner game and everything. And those are really important. And you, I think Mental Gym is great and you should read those books occasionally, but it's really great to have some distractions. I have some great podcasts about brewing beer that I regularly listen to that are just like nothing to do with anything. It's just fun and balanced work life. Because you said something a minute ago about keeping busy all the time, right? And it reminds me of that idea of the snow globe. You know, you shake up the snow globe and the snow obscures the, the little scene. You can't see what it is. And eventually the snow falls down. And what do we instantly do? And shake it back up again because we don't want to see anything. <laughs> and that, that state of constantly shaking the snow globe, I can't remember where I heard that, but it is a state that I know I find myself into where the squirrels are running around my head and just making me think, oh, I have to do this, have to do this. Whereas taking a step back and finding some balance in all this, especially when you're trying to reinvent yourself, whether it's creating a business or whatever, um, you got to find some balance in life. That's for sure. I have to remember, I have a podcast um, for, for you that also, if you want something to take your mind off of things, which is Dolly Parton's America. If you have not listened to it, go get it. It's, it's, I forget if it's seven or eight episodes. It's so great. It's so much fun. I, I like rationed it out because I didn't want to go through it too quickly. And yeah, it's a joy. I love that we started with Boston Symphony and now we're talking about Dolly Parton. This has been an outstanding podcast episode. Um, where can people find out more about you, Elizabeth Rowe? You can go to my website, which is IamElizabethRowe.com, um, and you can contact me through there. All right. We'll put all these links in the show notes. Elizabeth, thank you so much for taking some time to chat with me. This has been fun, and I'm hoping that at some point our lovely little bands are back at work and touring, and uh, we'll have to pop in and get a cup of coffee in Boston somewhere. Or I'll come to you in, in LA. Even better. All right. Thanks again. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Big thanks to Elizabeth Rowe for joining us today. And don't forget to check out her TED Talk down in the show notes and head over to IamElizabethRowe.com to learn more about her high impact coaching process. Okay, that's it for me today. You can find out more at HonestyPill.com. Check out the free resource library over there. And hey, if you're enjoying this podcast, please take a minute right now to head over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening, subscribe and leave a one sentence review. It really helps support the show so I can keep bringing you episodes just like this one. All right, everybody, this has been the Honesty Pill Podcast, episode three. Thanks for listening. See you next time.